Hello, uh, here's a, a video on hand calculations uh, for framed structures and for uh, virendial girders. Uh, so this is the fourth video in a series and will only really make sense if the previous uh, videos are worked through. Uh, the aim of the series of videos, the overall aim, is to show how, it's, uh, how to carry out an approximate analysis of a uh, multi-storey frame and a Virendil girder. So here's a Virendil girder and here's a, a multi-storey frame. Here's the multi-storey frame. Great looking structure. Um, right, so what are we doing uh, in this video? Well in this video uh, we're going to look at a two-storey frame and just work through an exercise in preliminary analysis. Uh, so far in previous videos uh, we looked at a stiff beam frame then we've looked at frames with constant EI and pinned feet, single storey frames, and then a single storey frame with fixed feet. And now we're going to look at uh, just a two storey frame, and in the next video we can look at multi storey frames. Mm -hmm. Right, and eventually we'll get on to a Virendil girder, which is just a little bit trickier than multi storey frames. So here's our frame that we're going to analyse. It's a two storey frame with pinned feet. Uh, and two loads applied, two horizontal loads applied at each floor level. That would often be through uh, wind blowing onto cladding, which in turn is transferred to uh, the floor decks. Uh, having pinned feet in a multi-storey frame is quite common. It's quite expensive to produce foundations which can resist uh, bending moments, and so it's cheaper to produce uh, pins uh, uh, at foundation level. So th this is a, a reasonably common arrangement which might provide lateral stability for part of a, a structure, a building for instance. Uh, here I've just made an assumption that all members are constantly constant AI. We've got rather small story heights but hey this is an exercise and uh, now we can get on with the uh, uh, analysis. Uh, what's our approach? Well in previous videos we've kind of developed a, a bit of a, a, an approach which some follows something along these lines. Uh, we look at the stiffness of the columns and we consider the stiffness of the joints of the columns when we do that. Uh, then we work out the horizontal reactions at the base of the columns. Okay. And then we look at uh, beams and columns that are fixed at each end and which may develop points of contraflexure due to bending moment changing sign and becoming zero at some points and we can add pins into our model at these points. Once we have pins in our model, we can create subframes, which is good, because uh, subframes are often easier to analyze than the entire frames. Once we've got our subframes, we can calculate bending moments, work out tension and compression faces, and draw the bending moment diagram. And then we can combine everything together into a single analysis. Right, uh, one of the hardest things I find in life and I find a lot of things hard in life, is to draw a deflected shape of a structure. Anything other than a simple beam or a cantilever is pretty difficult. However, I've had to have a go at this so that we can try to consider where the points of contraflexure may occur in our model. So here's the, here's the simplified frame with no deflection or, or anything, and here's the frame that I've, uh, pretty rubbish really, uh, attempted to draw the deflected shape. Now, so to, to make this clearer, because it's, it's I, think any, I don't think it's hard for anybody to do this, I, uh, I've, I've kind of separated out some of the elements. So for instance, this bottom column, the column that runs down from this joint here down to the pin, that's, that's really a, a vertical cantilever with a fix fixed at the top and a, a load pushing to the left at the base. And that's just going to be a single curve. That's going to be a simple curve. So there's no point of contraflexion there. The bending moment is always on the tension face. It stays where it is. How about uh, the upper leg of the same column? Well, that's fixed at the top, fixed at the bottom, and it's going to tend to move rightwards at the top. Ah, so even allowing for a little bit of rotation at the joints, uh, which I've tried to show in my diagrams, it's still going to develop this S shape and the bending moment is going to change from one side to another. So I think that this, which I've modelled as fixed and fixed, with the right moving rightwards relative to the bottom, with the top moving rightwards relative to the bottom, is going to develop a shape something like this. And I've not drawn that perfectly horizontally, I've just rotated it ever so slightly. Okay. 
because uh, I think that that will happen just about at this joint. Uh, this left hand column is similar to the right hand column. How about the top beam? Well the top beam again it's fixed at each end and as it as it moves over to the right there's going to be some rotation there's going to be a clockwise rotation at this joint and a clockwise rotation at this joint so if I rotate each of these joints clockwise well I could use a I used a broken bit of spaghetti there but as I rotate my uh, each joint you can see that I'm, I'm changing the bending moment and it goes from tension in the bottom at the left hand side to tension in the top at the right hand side tension tension and so I have end up with this point of contraflexion, which I can model as a pin. The mid-height beam is the same. Great. How are we doing? Oh, I'm running it. So that's so I've, I've modelled this structure now with four pins. So I could create um, subframes uh, anyhow I like. In fact, the way that I'll do this is I'll create a subframe at the top which is going to be a, a nice simple three pin frame and a subframe at the bottom which looks rather like a set of rugby goal posts okay so there's the top subframe <coughs> I've got a, a horizontal load of 20 kilonewtons applied to the top both the columns are similarly stiff and so the loads are uh, going to be uh, distributed equally uh, between the columns uh, and so uh, and the horizontal reaction is going to be equal at the base right so in this case with a horizontal reaction of 20 we end up with horizontal shears of 10 in each of the columns carrying this 20 kilonewtons horizontal force down to the next layer of the model uh, the story height is three meters so it's only one and a half meters to the uh, pin and so we can work out the bending moments at the um, at the tops of each leg uh, by considering each of these legs as a just a simple cantilever there it is with a force applied at the bottom, 10 kilonewtons. So 10 times one and a half meters gives us a bending moment of 15 kilonewton meters. Once we know the bending moment in the leg, we know the bending moment in the column. We can draw it on. That's our top subframe done. How about uh, the lower subframe? Uh, this is a little more complicated, but really we can we can model it in steps. Once again, we can look at the upper part of the column and we can say that that is really modelled as a cantilever with the 10 kilonewton internal shear applied as a point load at the pin or the false pin or the pretend pin so we've got 10 kilonewtons there and it's half a story height of 1.4 meters so we can work out the bending moment at the base of that column that column is wanting to turn around to the tune of um, 15 kilonewton meters so we've got 15 kilonewton meters in here uh, how about at the bottom well this column here we can model again as a fix with a, a load applied of 45 kilonewtons over a height of three meters so we can work out the bending moment there three times 45 uh, which is 135 kilonewton meters and that's tending to just like the top this, this this force here is tending to create a bending moment that way this is tending to create a bending moment in the same sense clockwise so this has got a bending moment here of uh, three times that which is 135 kilonewton meters so how do we then work out the bending moment at in the uh, beam oh <laughs> right well I've drawn out I might as well draw it out for the right hand side. So for the right hand side here, we've said that we have a bending moment in the top of 15 and a bending moment in the bottom of 135. That means that if I take moments around this joint, the bending moment in the beam must equal 15 plus 135. There must be a bending moment in the beam of 150 kilonewton meters. Simple as that, can't be anything else. Otherwise, this joint won't be in equilibrium. And for the left-hand joint, uh, it's exactly the same. I've got 150 kilonewtons heading clockwise. There must be 150 kilonewtons heading anti-clockwise to make this joint in equilibrium. And lo and behold, that's the bending moment diagram that I produce having uh, done this. 
uh, there's one stage that I, I didn't really uh, cover. I kind of skipped over it, so apologies for that. And that is, what are these, uh, how did I get the, uh, the base reactions here? Well, I know that I've got a force of 90 kilonewtons in total acting horizontally to the right. Therefore, I must have 90 kilonewtons in total acting horizontally to the left when I resolve horizontally for the whole frame. 90 divided equally between two supports means that I've got horizontal reactions of 45 kilonewtons at each support. Apologies for that not being in order. So here's my bending moment uh, diagram for the lower frame. These 15 kilonewton meter um, moments in the upper leg, 135 in the lower leg, and 150 heading down to zero uh, at the centre for the um, beam. I do now need to uh, combine these together. To uh, I need to combine the lower part and the upper part to create uh, the entire frame. Uh, bending moment diagram. But one thing I'd like to do is I'd just like to do one extra step and I know that uh, I've missed this out in the past in the past videos. So I've got 45 kilonewtons here, 45 kilonewtons there. So I know my horizontal reactions but I've never really considered my vertical reactions. What are these? Uh -huh. Well what I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take moments around one of the two supports and treat this entire frame as if it's just a single uh, block. So uh, if I do take moments around one of the supports, the frame itself looks like this, and I have 20 at the top, 70 here. If I take moments around this point, I must have a vertical reaction here. So I'm assuming that, so I'm saying uh, 70 times three meters plus 20 times six meters minus six meters because that's the bay width times v all add up to zero i've assumed a vertical reaction upwards i do my calculation and it turns out that v is 55 kilonewtons i can now simply resolve vertically <coughs> and i can see that there's only v heading upwards therefore the reaction on the left hand side must be 55 running downwards okay that's good so we'll look now at the final oops, at the final frame. So there we are. So for the for the entire frame, I've drawn on the, the bending moment diagram for each of the uh, legs and the um, beams. I've added in the horizontal reactions and the vertical reactions, and that's pretty much uh, a two-story frame completed. Now you'll be glad to know that once you can analyse a single store a single bay two-story frame really you can analyze a multi-story building so uh, so i'd like to end up with my favorite virandil girder bridge so we're now one step closer to being able to analyze a multi-story frame structure or a virandil girder so uh, uh, in the next video there'll be some exercises for you to go uh, go at so uh, good luck with them and uh, i'd just like to say thank you for watching